Good afternoon. I'm Stefan Yost. I'm the Michael and Sonia Kerner Director and CEO of the Art Gallery of Ontario. And today, this afternoon, we're joined by Glenn Lowry, who's the David Rockefeller Director of the Museum of Modern Art in New York City. Um, we like to begin our talks by acknowledging that uh, we are on the traditional territories of the Missa Mississauga of the New Credit, uh, which has also been home to the Huron, Wendat, and Haudenosaunee through time. So um, I want to first welcome everybody. And before Glenn and I chat, a couple points of housekeeping. Um, first of all, um, you're welcome to submit questions to us. The format's going to be pretty simple. We'll talk for about a half hour and then we'll take about 10 minutes of questions. Kathleen and Annie are off screen and they'll feed us questions um, so we can try to answer them the best of our ability. Um, we will um, also, uh, we, we would um, also love you to join us at ago.ca to um, continue these conversations. Um, next week, we'll be meeting with Kaywin Feldman, who's the director of the National Gallery of um, Art in Washington, DC. And the week after that, we have Ann Pasternick, who's um, uh, director of the Brooklyn Museum. And finally, uh, in, in three weeks, we'll have Matthew Teitelbaum uh, rejoining us for a conversation. So every week we're doing this. Now I should say at ago.ca, there's a lot of events going on. So we're gonna do probably four to six live events a week. Um, and there'll be a lot of pre-recorded uh, events as well. And if your parents trying to figure out how to homeschool, um, the education team has done some really great projects that you can do with kids in your house. Um, this is all part of our effort to stay together during this period. And I just really wanna thank all the members, the curator circles and all of our public. We've got, you know, 150,000-ish annual pass holders and 100,000 members. So it really, really uh, means a lot that you're choosing to join us. So welcome, Glenn. Um, you know, many of you uh, know that Glenn used to be the director here at the AGO from 1990 to 95. And he also um, is married, like me, to a Canadian. Um, so uh, has strong Canadian ties. Um, so really open question to begin with, what's top of your mind and what's on top of your mind with MoMA, New York? Thanks, Stefan. What a great pleasure to join you and to be with all my friends from Canada and the AGO in particular. Well, I think I'm probably like everybody else. It's trying to figure out how we're going to navigate through the next 12 to 24 months as the real impact of COVID-19 and the slowdown, if not the almost halt of the economy, uh, roils what we do in the cultural world. It's very difficult to imagine uh, how you run an institution for a prolonged period of time with virtually no revenues or very diminished revenues and still deliver great programs. And so we're trying to make sure that we can be as vital as we ever were, but recognize it's going to have to be in very different ways. You were just saying that you, you did something and you had people really from all over the world coming to, to, to the events at MoMA. Well, I think one of the beneficiaries of this catastrophic situation from the point of view of the econo economy is it's forced all of us to learn how to really use the digital tools that have always been there or have been there for a long period of time and that were part of our program, but never really the principal part of our program. And uh, like you at the AGO, we pivoted uh, on the day we closed from uh, real space to virtual space. And, one of the incredible things that happened when we did that is that suddenly we could have live conversations with colleagues, friends, members, uh, and interested people from around the world. And uh, I did a conversation a couple of weeks ago, and what really struck me is that I was talking to and getting questions from people in Perth and Singapore, in France and Germany, uh, as well as the United States. And suddenly we were a global community sharing an idea and a conversation. And there was something incredibly heartening about that. Yeah, yeah it's been, people have been working really well together. I've been amazed how the museum directors kind of around the world are kind of networking, sharing information, kind of how do you reopen? What are some values that you've had which have kind of come sharply into focus where you said, I care about this and then maybe some other stuff you just don't care that much about? Well, that's an ongoing question and how to foreground what matters most uh, to, what, to every decision we make. And we started with a very simple premise that our board um, supported, which was we're about art and people. 
So every decision we make should be based on our commitment to art and our commitment to people. And in terms of people in the short term, that meant commitment to our staff. What, what was necessary to ensure that our staff was safe, secured, and employed? Uh, and then what did we need to do to share our interest, our commitment to the art and the artists uh, that we believe in? And so those two simple filters, how does it affect art? How does it affect people? Have been our guiding principle as we've looked at budgets, at programs, at how we're going to reopen, uh, to whom we're going to reopen for, and so on. So uh, how, are you, how is your audience changing? How do you project the audience you know, in September versus September a year ago? So New York is a tourist-centric city. Uh, and the first impact that COVID-19 will have is that we'll have no tourists or very, very few tourists. Uh, airlines have been severely ratcheted back. Many hotels are closed, restaurants are closed. The reopening is gonna be slow and gradual. And we're assuming that certainly through uh, December of, of 2020, we'll have virtually no tourists and even in the period from January to June of 21, it's likely to be diminished tourism. So that means, first of all, uh, an audience that will be substantially smaller than our current audience. When I say current audience, when we closed in uh, March, we were on track to have 3 million visitors for the year. Uh, you know, I think we'll be lucky to have a million to a million and a half, and it's anybody's guess. And even if we could have a million and a half, that is if the demand was there, it's not yet clear that we can accommodate safely and securely a million and a half visitors. So when we do reopen, we're going to reopen slowly, a uh, step at a time to make sure that anyone and everyone who visits feels that they're getting a great opportunity to see art, but they're not being at any kind of physical risk. Obviously, COVID has impacted everybody's exhibition schedule. Um, are you starting to think about exhibitions differently? Are there kinds of exhibitions that are kind of pre-COVID exhibitions that we'll no longer be doing or that will be, or, or that COVID will kind of inspire us to look at exhibitions in a different way? I'm not sure. Of course, you, you know, you can't escape the moment and, and we all live in it and are going to want to reflect on it. I think that will manifest itself more in terms of how we install our permanent collection as opposed to any uh, dramatic changes we're likely to make to our exhibition program in the short term, in part because it will be extremely hard to switch gears. Uh, loans are gonna be incredibly difficult. Um, many of our exhibitions as you know, because we share some, uh, are planned long in advance. And so to get out of those or change those dramatically will be very difficult. But when you're working with a living artist like Wolfgang Tillmans, yeah. Yeah. Uh, it seems to me um, almost impossible that he won't somehow include work in that beautiful survey that we'll do together that reflects on the moment. Yeah. On the other hand, you know, we're doing a big exhibition, uh, Sophie Teubor Arp, and that show will go ahead pretty much as organized pre-COVID. And there's always an urge, I think, on many, especially in the media, to assume that artists somehow are going to suddenly change their perspective and their work uh, in the face of a crisis. Yeah. But if you look back historically, there are relatively few crises that generated in the short term uh, great art. It takes a long time for artists to digest what's happened, to think about it, to learn how to respond in their art. They may respond immediately and dramatically in, in personal choices they make and in causes they support, but that's somewhat different from the degree to which a crisis starts to affect the art that's being made. What, um, so you had this extraordinarily high moment. Um, with the reopening of the new MoMA. It, they had a, had a chance to see it three times and really, I think your team did an extraordinary job of just framing art history, uh, broadening it. In some ways, it really validates many of the great works of the past, but it also 
you know, just really kind of elevates some other works who just we never saw as it's so important. Tell me a little bit about that process of reinstalling your permanent collection and what were some kind of key decisions that made it so successful? So we spent a lot of time, probably close to a half a decade, thinking about the ways in which we wanted to both interrogate our existing collection and expand that collection to embrace the kinds of ideas that we were interested in, a more global perspective, a more nuanced understanding of modernity, uh, commitment to um, enlarging the canon to include women, African-American artists, artists from Latin America, elsewhere in the world, and to be more a place of querying than a place of answers. Uh, I think there was a generation of curators at the museum, especially in the 70s and 80s and early 90s, that believed that the museum's responsibility was to give the answer. Uh, and I'm from a different generation, and so are the remarkable curators who work at the museum. And it's more interesting to us to frame the question. Uh, and I think that's an essential component to working in a museum of modern art. I mean, we don't have the answer. The art we deal with, the artists that we are committed to are still alive. They're still making art. They're still challenging us and thinking about new ideas and new ways of interpreting the world. And we want to be receptive to that. So we had to uh, spend a lot of time adding to the collection critical works of art that uh, enlarged our perspective or complicated our perspective. Then we had to break down the barriers that had governed the museum's practice for probably 35 or 40 years where we displayed our collection by department. So we collected painting and sculpture and we had galleries for painting and sculpture. And we collected photography and we had galleries for photography and so on down the line. And it took a long time uh, to learn how to collectively work across media and to make a commitment that actually we wanted to show the collection whole, not broken into its pieces and that we would use a chronological frame, a loose chronological frame that said, okay, on the fifth floor, it's early modern art from all media and all parts of the world that we were uh, able to uh, display. And in, on the fourth floor, it would be mid-century, again, across all media. And then uh, the second floor, which is uh, the, the principal area for contemporary art, it would be contemporary art across all media. That was complicated because we have six chief curators, each of whom is responsible for his or her department and media. They each had to give something up. Uh, was, you know, when they each had their galleries to work with, they didn't have five other people going, ah, I'm not so sure that's what I wanna do. But suddenly uh, they all had to arrive at some form of agreement. I'm not saying consensus because we made a really big effort to avoid galleries that were purely consensual, that is the, the, the result of everybody agreeing on everything. We had a team leader for each floor and he or she had the ultimate responsibility. So there was somebody who could say no or yes. And then we, a little bit like a baseball team, we uh, said to each team leader, You've got 22 galleries on your floor. Uh, we all kind of debated about what the thematic or principal issue of each gallery was. And then we said, go pick the team you want to do that gallery. Oh, I see. And so there, each gallery had a very different team than the next gallery. And some people worked on all three floors or some people only worked on one floor, but we had you know, roughly 70 curators to distribute across uh, whatever it is, 66 galleries. Most galleries, because they did involve work from multiple media, had two or three curators. Uh, and it really was like baseball cards. I want him. No, she goes there. I want her. No, no, yes, no. <laughs> I was, of course, left as the ultimate. Uh, I didn't have to do very much in that case, but I was the arbiter in case somebody was being pulled in eight different directions. The umpire would say, yeah. What, what, what surprised you most about the public's response? Oh, unbelievably supportive it was. I mean, we did not expect that pretty much every 
uh, constituency that we're engaged with from members to the general public to general media to people you know who write for specialized art magazines to scholars uh, to colleagues in other institutions would respond so favorably i mean for us this is v1 we and we're getting ready for v2 uh, which is i hope an even better version of where we are but we expected this to be somewhat um, problematic, controversial, and liked by some people and despised by other people. And it didn't turn out that way. It, it, it was much more universally uh, acclaimed, which of course is, you love that, but actually criticism is also very good. It's helpful. You, you need people to tell you uh, what you need to do. But I, I, you know, the part here that, that often isn't discussed and that's actually very much related to the pandemic is, so we had a strategy for the collection. But as I said, we're about art and people. We also had a strategy for our public, uh, and which was to have a very high touch engagement. Yeah. We essentially tried to evoke the spirit of being in the living room of a good friend. Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, a, great, a great friend of mine, Douglas Ross, who's a New York based artist, went through with him and he said that MoMA brought back kind of uh, intellectual and emotional intimacy in this mm -hmm. hang. And I thought that was really um, well, that's it. high, high praise. Yeah. I get chills down my back when I hear that because it's exactly what we wanted to do. Uh, how, and it was all about, in a very large institution, how do you still create these moments of intimacy? Psychological, intellectual, uh, emotional. And one of the consequences, I think, in the short term of COVID is that all of the high touch qualities that we were able to layer in, seating, uh, um, uh, curators wandering through the galleries, talking to anyone who wanted to listen, uh, you know, uh, educator-led uh, tours, all, all that stuff is gone, right? That for security reasons and safety reasons, we're going to become a touchless institution. Yeah. Uh, and that saddens me in the short term because what I like as much as I like the installation was a sense of welcome that we were able to generate. So we'll have to work on how to evoke a parallel sense of welcome despite the COVID. What are a couple details you would want people to notice in the new MoMA when you guys reopen that most people miss? Ah, um, how intuitive it is. That is, yeah. that is the, we've tried to layer in everything from wayfinding to information uh, to hosts who can answer your questions so that you don't actually have to think about where you're going. You can just start wandering and you don't ever feel lost, that there's yeah. always a point of reference. I think also that I hope people uh, would notice that works of art are talking to each other, that we've really tried to install each gallery as a conversation. Yeah. That the conversations are not meant to be obscure or overly erudite. They're, they're meant to be the kind of conversations you might have with good friends in a living room. Yeah. Uh, and that the works of art join you in that conversation. And then finally, I hope people will, will see, would see that actually the, there are so many fresh voices that it isn't just Matisse and Picasso and Pollock and you know all the great and glorious artists that we are well known for, but it's also Suzanne Duchamp and Tarsila de Omaral and Janet Cardiff and yeah. you go down a laundry list of artists that perhaps are much less well known, but who absolutely hold their place yeah. in the galleries. Yeah, there were definitely those paintings where I was like, I don't know who that is, but it's really good. And it's next to a named a famous artist, right? So that's, that's fun. A um, couple Canadian artists you think the world should know more about. Oh, my, my list is long. So, you know, um, obviously, we're deeply committed to uh, Jeff Wall. Uh, and I, I don't know that the world needs to know about Jeff Wall, because he is one of the giants of his generation. And we just talked about Janet Cardiff and George Buras, but I'd also add to that John Pangnark and Lucy Tassior and, you know, pa uh, Patterson Ewan and, you know, you just go down this list of great artists that, uh, that are really impactful uh, yeah. and that often uh, 
just because of the nature of the, the art world we live in, don't get anywhere near the intention that they deserve. And uh, any kind of sense of how COVID is, how big the damage is going to be in the art market? You, have a... you know, it's an interesting one. Uh, what I hear from dealers that I talk to and collectors is there's still a lot of art that's trading hands, uh, that the market hasn't stopped completely. Obviously, the auction world uh, has changed, but even online auctions are uh, working away and, and people are realizing, you know, 500,000, a million dollars for works of art online, which I find staggering that people would be willing uh, to spend that. I have a feeling that come the autumn, when there'll be greater movement and the ability to get back into a gallery to look at work of art, works of art, you know, the market will pick back up and look, we're in the middle of what is likely to be one of the worst recessions in certainly the history of the United States and possibly North America. There's going to be a lot less money around, but there's still going to be money and there's still going to be art and there are still going to be dealers. Yeah. So, you know, I think the market um, will, not, will not disappear at all. And actually taking a little steam or maybe even a lot of steam out of the market is probably not a bad thing. It was yes. an, certainly in the modern and contemporary area, it was wildly uh, hot and, and inflated. And so if it settles down a little bit and maybe isn't so frenetic and maybe there aren't quite as many art fairs or biennials that one has to go racing off to, uh, that's not a bad thing yes. from my perspective. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah I, I'm, my hope is that a, a new generation of dealers recognize a new generation of artists, right? And the sure. prices might be, sure. might, might be different. So behind you, you've got this extraordinary photograph of a garden. Um, tell us about it. And each time I've spoken to you, you've had a different photograph of an extraordinary garden behind you. So, so as some of you know, may know, I'm married to uh, Susan Chambers from Montreal. Uh, and I think a response to having grown up in the snow is this unfettered desire to make green things grow at every moment of the day and night. And so uh, for the last eight weeks, she's been puttering in her garden, something she's never been able to do because we're in New York most of the time. Uh, we're actually now in a small house about an hour and a half north of New York. And so each day she is posting on my virtual uh, background, a different picture from the garden. It's, it's beautiful. It's nice. And um, we're jealous because you guys are a good month ahead of us here in, here in Toronto. Um, some advantages to being South. Yeah, exactly. Um, before we go into some questions, um, what are uh, some things you think we should be thinking about? Like big challenges, things kind of looking out a year, whatever, that maybe we should pay attention to that. Well, I certainly think that any institution that deals with living artists, as I know the AGO does, needs to think about what we as institutions can do for artists in this time. What are the, it's not just about exhibitions and public programs, it's, you know, how can we as institutions embrace a community that's hit, been hit very hard by yeah. COVID-19? And what are the kinds of initiatives that we can develop together for artists? And how will that expand actually our programming? Well, we were chatting before uh, we entered the conversation now, we talked about you know, the impact of the digital world. I think we need to concentrate on how we can collapse the digital um, and the physical, that they're really part and parcel of a continuous experience. So how can we make that uh, work coherently for our various publics? You know, I'm, I have an enormous amount of anxiety at the moment over how COVID-19 and for us, what has been now eight weeks of isolation, and I think it's probably very much the same in Canada. What's the impact going to be on people who have been essentially sequestered in their apartments for that amount of time alone? You know, if you're lucky enough to have a partner or children or, or you're sequestered with friends, you have... A different kind of experience than if you're all alone in your apartment yeah, sure. and can barely go out. So I think there are going to be some long-term residual mental health issues that we're going to want to deal with, both in terms of the community at large, but what I care about specifically is our own staff. Yep. 
I'm one of the things one of the things we did um AGO, we we managed to keep everybody on board. It was tough, but some donors stepped up and everybody took a 25% pay cut in order to keep everybody employed between now and September 15th. But what we've launched internally is something we're calling AGOU. And so if you're working you know, 25 hours a week for the AGO, uh, we're asking you to participate in online learning. So there, the whole staff is divided up in groups of 15 and you, you know, uh, we've, you can learn languages, you can learn art history. So part of it is just keeping our staff in touch with each other, but yeah. that if you're a security officer living alone, but you have to check in with 15 of your colleagues at the beginning of the day and then talk at the end of the day about what you learned. It's just trying to keep that social cohesion together, but also, um, hey, well, it's great. If guards are learning Mandarin and French and Anishinaabe, that's, that's great. It's fantastic. Are you so, it's, so do you have outside people teaching courses? Uh, we have so many great educators here. So we're, we're actually using Coursera catalog courses mm -hmm. and some of those are, are <clears throat> MoMA developed, um, but they're free. So people are just going. Um, but then we also have educators who are teaching classes. Um, but anybody can, on staff can contribute. And maybe we'll open that up in the future to, to the general public. But That's behind great. the scenes, we got AGOU going. Which yeah. no, it makes, great. makes perfect Help, sense. Kind of, I, think, I, I, yeah. I think there's just a lot to be done in terms of trying to make sure staff stay whole yes. and yeah. get through this without any kind of long-term emotional issues. I'm an optimist, by, I'm a pessimistic optimist, um, by which I mean, uh, I'm generally optimistic, but there's a dark streak that I'm always aware of. So I, I, I see this moment as a 12 to 24 month moment when it's going to be a real struggle and then I see this period from 24 months to 48 months when things start to really recover in a substantial way. And, you know, five years is a long time. It, it will be in a very different place and we will, have, we will have absorbed a lot of lessons. We will have surely made our institutions better by being more focused and more, um, more efficient in, in use of resources. But we'll also still be doing what we do, which is to produce great exhibitions and great programs and thoughtful installations of the collection and engaging our public. Yeah. So I, you know, I don't think that this is a, um, a shock to the mission. I think it's a shock to the operations. Yes. Slightly That's different. Right. Uh, That's right. That's right. We've got some great questions here, um, and and this is a was a just a beautiful question. As two museum directors, what personal rituals do you miss when you arrive at your museum every day? Ah, well, I can tell you mine. I'm sure you have an equally yeah. uh, important one. So I, when I started out as a young curator uh, at the Smithsonian Institution, uh, the then director, who was a terrific scholar and uh, brilliant curator said the first thing you do when you come to a museum if you work at it is you walk the galleries quietly without anybody bothering you and you take a little notebook with you and you just note things that you've seen that you like that you think require attention and I do that pretty much every day that I'm at the Museum of yeah. Modern Art. And now what I do is I close my eyes and I walk the museum uh, in my mind. Yeah. Yeah. We still adhere to that ritual. It's, yeah, it's, I, I miss the collection a great deal. Um, I, I must say, I miss saying hello to the security officer in the morning. I, I just, for some reason, that just feels like the start of the day. And I miss Sue Sen, my assistant. We're, we're obviously always in touch, but, but it, um, you know, it's, it's different having it in person. Somebody asked, a crystal ball, when might the AGO and MoMA open? Huh. Anyone who can get that right, you know, go immediately and buy a lottery ticket. Yeah. What are you thinking about, Stefan? Uh, we're modeling different models. Basically, we think probably someplace between Canada Day with a July 1st and September 15th. Um, we're going to do it when it's safe, um, but we have plans that are quite far along. So if we hear that it can start earlier, we'll start earlier. If, if not, um, we'll, we'll, we'll delay it a bit. My sense is we'll, we'll have pretty severe limits on how many people can come in. So, um, Set by the government? Uh, that's my guess. Um, I'm asking just for very clear rules from the government. They've been, I must say that all three levels of government have been working beautifully together. I mean, just really flawlessly. So, um, we don't know how that works in, in New York. No, it's been great. The it's government been, working together you know, seems... On the first day of the crisis, the, um, 
the Minister of Sports, Culture, Tourism, and Art, uh, gave me her cell phone, said, you need anything, call me. Um, and she's been super responsive. So, um, so anyways, that's my, my guess is it'll be July-ish, but it'll be slow. Um, and there might be a second wave too. So we just have to be prepared for that. But that's exactly how we're thinking. Yeah. Sometime yeah. between July and mid-September. So um, question for Glenn. Sad to miss the Dorothea Lang and Donald Judd shows. Will you be able to prolong the, the run of these shows? We hope so. So we're in the middle of um, talking to all the lenders to our Judd exhibition about extending it to the end of December because we feel that for sure should be a window in which we will be uh, open. So with any luck, it will be up. And if you go to our site, um, moma.org, and you go to virtual views, you will be able to hear a conversation uh, with Sally Mann and uh, Sarah Meister on Dorothea Lang, and with Ann Temkin and Flavin Judd on the Donald Judd Show. So we're trying to keep those exhibitions alive through our Virtual Views program, as well as trying to make sure that we can extend them for the longest possible period of time once we reopen. Yeah, yeah. No, that's, I, we had all sorts of ideas, but we're going to, we're going to basically keep the um, Illusions show and the Diane Arbus show up. Um, and then we're also uh, going to be opening a major Hegu Yang exhibition. 85% uh, of the material is already here. It's just all crated. So it, the week after we closed, the shipments arrived from Korea and Germany. So we'll install that. Um, but, oh, I can't and then, wait to do that. And then we're going to do in December, where I don't even know if this is public yet, but we're going to um, do the Studio 54 show. We're working with, with Brooklyn, just under the idea that, you know, people hopefully will want a little disco music and a little lightness come, <laughs> come December. We'll see. <laughs> we'll see. Um, uh, I'd like to know uh, how your love and expertise of Islamic art translates into your role at MoMA. Many people don't know that uh, Glenn is a scholar of Islamic art. Um, and just curious what the connection is between your scholarly area and your leadership at MoMA. <laughs> well, there's no direct connection in a way, and yet there is. Uh, so I spent the first part of my career studying medieval Persian painting uh, from the 16th and 17th centuries and architecture from Mughal India of the 16th and 17th centuries. And what I was able to do when I came to the Museum of Modern Art was to migrate that interest to contemporary artists from those regions, from Iran, from India, from um, the Middle East, Turkey, Egypt, the Gulf, and so on. And so I've been writing about uh, artists from the region. I'm deeply interested in how uh, contemporary art is practiced in the Islamic world to, to use a kind of big rubric to capture a very complex and uh, geographically distinct area. And I think on a very um, personal level, being deeply interested in a culture other than one's own informs the kind of initiatives you're interested in provoking at the institution. I think, it, I think you know, I arrived at the museum and deeply interested, of course, in modern and contemporary European and North American art, but also extremely aware that that was a very small slice of a very big world and that we needed to expand our horizons. And it took me close to you know, 15 or 20 years to convince the institution hmm. that we needed to do that. And I learned when I was at the AGO, a lesson from Michael Hazley, in fact, uh, who you know well. I, I learned a lot of lessons from Michael Hazley. The first and the most important was balance the budget. Okay, but good. After he, me, after he taught me that, uh, I, you know, I learned very quickly that there are two different kinds of change. There's dramatic change that you can do by fiat, yeah. pound your fist on the table and say, I want this. And there's sustainable change, which you do by a much more subtle and complex process that, in, that involves people buying into the yeah. idea and then owning it so yes. that you can walk away. Uh, and while I, you know, probably was not as skilled at 
sustainable change when I was at the AGO just because I needed to learn how to do that. Uh, I certainly try to practice that at the Museum of Modern Art. And so rather than sort of jumping up and down and saying, why aren't we looking at art from the Middle East or from the subcontinent or from Latin America, or you name, you name the region that produces great art, it was more like, okay, let's develop a strategy that over time keeps us deeply committed to those regions. And we started with Latin America for a number of reasons that are uh, very MoMA centric. And we've been expanding that out to Asia, to uh, Eastern Europe, to the subcontinent, to the Middle East. It, you know, if I were to walk away tomorrow morning, I don't think that interest would change. I think yeah. curators have, and educators and conservators and archivists uh, have embraced the notion that we need to be present in our thinking and in our relationships around the world. And that to me, I think is the most substantial manifestation of what actually started with an awareness on my part that great art was being made in Iran and India and Pakistan and elsewhere. Yeah, that's, uh, that's something I think about. What's a temporary change and what's a, what's a short-term change? Um, somebody just asked if we went eyeglass shopping together. <laughs> so, <laughs> I got these at the AGO shop. When we reopen, go buy them. What's great about these is they, you can, you can, um, uh -huh. They're pretty indestructible for reading glasses. Um, finally, um, one work of art that you own in your house that you, you and Susan love. Oh, um, probably the work of art that I love the most, um, and Susan too, is an extraordinarily beautiful drawing by Leon Ferrari, who was a great Argentine artist, came to prominence in the late 60s, died only a couple of years ago at almost 100. And during uh, the reign of terror in Argentina, he wrote a series of letters to the generals. And these letters are indecipherable. They're just, they're, they're, they're kind of calligraphic. Uh, you can't actually read them. They're, they're like spontaneous drawing, almost uh, uh, from a distance, you think that they are legible. But in fact, as you approach it, you realize uh, that it's all about the hand and the gesture. And we were lucky enough uh, to acquire a drawing from Leon years and years and years ago when I visited him in his studio. It's a small drawing. It's, it's modest by museum standards, uh, but it's deeply powerful and yeah. personal and something that um, I think about all the time, actually. It's those work to own a work of art is fantastic, which is my pitch here that if you want to help an artist in Toronto or in Canada or anywhere, and you're listening to this great time to buy one people artists need a little bit of cash right now. So um, oh, if you thought you could, if you can afford it, um, it's a good, a good thing to do. So thank you very much. And thanks all our visitors to, to who signed in over a thousand people are watching this now. So I just want to thank everybody and join us next week where um, we'll be talking to the director of the National Gallery in Washington, DC, Kaywin Feldman. Thank you very much, Glenn. Thank you, Stefan. All right. Have a good afternoon. Bye-bye.